continue our series of sermons in Ephesians up to chapter 3. And we're actually looking at the Apostle Paul being in prison. Now, if you go to the book of Acts, you find at the end of the book of Acts, the last couple of chapters, talk about the, uh, the journey of Paul eventually going to Rome. And uh, part of his reason to go to Rome is that he wanted the gospel to be uh, uh, not the cause of uh, persecution. Now, sadly, he's not successful because uh, not long after he himself is killed, as is the Apostle Peter in Rome, we find that Nero uses the Christians as an excuse to blame for the fire that he started. And uh, then you find for the next couple of hundred years, massive uh, times of Christian persecution on an on and off basis in the Roman Empire until the time of Constantine, about 300 plus AD. And uh, it's interesting, uh, a survey I was reading recently, which is the most persecuted religion in the world, do you think? Christianity. Christianity. What percentage of persecution of world religions would be Christian-based persecution? 80%. 80%. You've read the same article as I did. <laughs> so four out of every five people who are persecuted for their faith are Christians being persecuted for their faith. And uh, it's nearly impossible to find a country where Christians aren't being somehow attacked. So even uh, here in Australia, which I think is a lovely country, there's numerous times you'll come across attacks uh, and uh, different difficulties. You'll hear about people who, um, uh, who've applied for jobs where they're Christians and they know they're the most eminent person who's applied for the job, but it's their Christian faith has been a stumbling block for people. Mm. And uh, I can think for myself when I was working, my boss took me aside because he knew as a Christian says, I hope you realise that we're in business and there are times you will need to lie for us and as a Christian, uh, you can't have your ethics influence how you act at work. And uh, uh, we had a, a lovely man, uh, Mr. Lake, who ran um, the uh, Church of England Homes at Carlingford. And in business, what he would do, he would, uh, as a non-Christian, he would do most of his business in pubs. And he'd say to the guys, well, let's go down to the pub and we'll have a beer and we'll, we'll work out all our business stuff there. Well, he gets very, very profoundly converted to Christ. And so he goes to his boss and says, look, I've become a Christian. I realise my pub going is probably inappropriate as a business thing. And so I intend to uh, still work as hard as I possibly can. But in future, I will not be taking people to pubs and clubs to entertain them to get business. Now, at that stage, he was their top salesman, which his boss said, if your sales figures go down, you're fired. It wasn't like, if you get down to third place, I'll be unhappy. It's like, if you, if you don't stay number one, you're gone. So he goes to all his customers and says, look, I've become a Christian. It uh, means a lifestyle change. I won't be taking the pubs. I apologise for that. I will still seek to do my very best to serve you as a, a salesperson. But I just want you to know this is what I'm going to be doing. And he left it in God's hands. His sales went up. <laughs> so he then starts thinking. So his boss was happy with him being a Christian. But there's that sense of not knowing. And I imagine he could have gone down even and when the boss says, you're in second place, bad luck, you're gone. And so uh, persecution is there. So the Apostle Paul's in prison. So what I want to do is look at the uh, uh, four letters that Paul writes in that time. Philemon, Colossians, Philippians and Ephesians. Because each of the letters gives us little whispers about him being in prison. What does it mean for him to be in prison? So the first question I want to ask is this. How did the Apostle Paul view being in prison himself? So I've just grabbed some of the, the, the scriptures from each of these four books. So Philemon 1.1 1, 1 says, starts with, it says, I'm Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. So he very clearly says, this is who I am and this is what's happening to me. And then he says, and Timothy, our brother. And he explains exactly why he believed he was in prison. In verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13, he says, I'm imprisoned for the gospel. So it's not because he's been a thief, it's not because he's been a murderer, not because he's embezzled anybody. He knows the gospel has put him into prison. Now in Colossians chapter 4 verse 3 he says at the same time pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. It doesn't say you know, pray that we get out of prison. He says we're in prison pray that we can use this prison time as a gospel opportunity. So may uh, God open the door for us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison. So he knows why he's in prison. Say so God's put me here. May God use me in my prison time. Now, Philippians 1 verse 7 says, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. So each of the letters is very clear. The gospel is linked to his prison time. 
And our reading tonight from Ephesians chapter one, verse uh, uh, three, verse one says, "For this reason, I, Paul, a prison, a prisoner for Christ Jesus." Then he adds an extra distinctive, on behalf of you Gentiles. And you start thinking, when he was arrested, it wasn't for being, it wasn't a sense of saying anything about the Gentiles for his arrest. But Paul knew there's a far deeper issue, that the, the Roman Empire only allowed two legal religions. And you had to belong to one of these two religions to be in the empire and not face persecution or arrest or imprisonment or whatever. And you either had to be a Caesar worshipper or a Jew. And you think, well, why were Jews allowed to get away with blue murder? Like, why weren't other religions given the same liberty? Is because if you were Jewish, you paid a massive tax to Caesar. And Caesar didn't say, oh, good, the money will go into general funds and, and the treasury. The money literally went to Caesar. And so uh, in modern day language, he, uh, the, uh, the, the Caesar, the head of the Roman Empire, and every year you get a couple of million dollar check from Jews in Israel. So they say, we, we, uh, we love you, we will serve you, we will die for you, we just won't bow down on our knees and call you God, but we will be supportive of you. And so when Pilate uh, is having controversy with Jesus, what do they say to him? we will tell uh, Caesar that you're not his friend. And Pilate is quite scared because he knows they are Caesar's friend. And a number of the, uh, the different kings of Israel uh, had very, very strong friendship links with the Roman uh, Caesars and uh, the, the power people in uh, Caesar. Why? Because of the money factor. And so what he's trying to do is he wants uh, Christianity to be seen as a legal part of the Jewish faith and so if you're legally part of the Jewish faith then you won't get arrested persecuted and thrown into prison and he knew that he could use his Jewish, uh, his um, Roman citizenship uh, to force the issue that he could go to literally in front of Caesar into Rome to get his name cleared that if he clears his name then he clears the name of all Christians because they'd use his court case as the landmark case for all future cases. So then we go back to uh, some of the other passages. What else does it say? In Philippians 1 verse 12, it says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And you start saying, well, you're in prison. Wouldn't you be out preaching on the streets, advance the gospel far more than you being locked away? But it then goes on the same verse 13. So it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You say, well, how did that come about? You know, did the guys gossip with each other? I said, well, no, all these guys take it in turn having to look after you. And so day after day, you might find there's a guy who's actually probably chained to Paul. And Paul says, fantastic, I've got eight hours to share the gospel with this guy and he can't go anywhere. And if the guy wants to fall asleep, I just wake him up and say, mate, I've got some more things I want to tell you. And so Paul literally evangelized person after person after person. Now, I remember reading a story once about a man called Watchman Nee, a Chinese uh, missionary and preacher who spent years and years in prison. And uh, one of his reasons they didn't like him is he was a very, very popular speaker and book writer. And they thought by putting him in the prison, that would stop his books coming out. And of course, being in prison in general populace was no good because his books would somehow be smuggled out. And the government got all upset with that. And they said, what we'll do is we'll put him into a solitary confinement. So they think, well, then what happens? He said, well, he then started evangelizing the guards. They get converted. His books kept on coming out. And once in solitary confinement, they said, well, you need one prisoner who's happy to go from cell to cell to collect everybody's um, body waste, so to speak, to put it in uh, subtle terms. And so he literally went around with the bucket from cell to cell collecting all the unmentionables, and each cell they went to, he would have 30 seconds to evangelise each prisoner while he was getting them to pass stuff out and, and, and then hand, hand the empty container back. And what happens? All these people get converted. And uh, the authorities got quite upset with this. And they found out a number of the guards got converted. So what they do? They killed those guards. So that will stop it. The guards are dead. Put new guards in. But the books kept on coming out. What happened? He converted the next lot of guards. And so uh, as Watchman Nee used his time, so here the Apostle Paul has that same sense of using 
the bad situation for the glory of God. Then in Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, two verses later, it says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul knew that his time in prison encouraged the other Christians out in the world to say, if Paul can evangelize in prison, what's stopping me evangelizing and I'm not in prison at all? Then uh, how does Paul view his time in imprisonment? Uh, Philippians 4 verse 12. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And it's a verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's a verse that love, lots of Christians love quoting that verse. The background is, I can do all things through him who strengthens me while I am in prison, in jail, being persecuted in a hard time. And so it's not saying God helps me in my fuzzy wuzzy times. It says God's in the depths of every moment. And in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 19, it says, And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly, to proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul was very conscious that no matter what happens to him, he had to speak for Jesus. So my second question I want to answer tonight is, did Paul think other believers would also be imprisoned? He knew that he was in prison. He'd set the, uh, the precedent for his arrest so that this issue could be dealt with. And it says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. So Paul sees that uh, for Christians uh, part of the norm is that there will, will be times that we'll go for difficulties. Now everyone's difficulties will be different. Everyone's situation will be different. For some it may be members of your own family that will make life hard and saying things like why do you go to ch church? Why do you bother being a Christian? You know, why can't we go out for family dues on Sunday? Uh, so, you know, subtle things. It can be workplace where they say, uh, you know, you've got to lie if you're going to work for us. Uh, it can be people who try to get you involved in immoral behaviour. Uh, I've got a friend of mine who spends his life trying to get me drunk, realising that I don't drink alcohol at all. He just feels that he wants to stop me that. He just, if I got drunk, he'd be happy as Larry. So there's always that sense of immorality that uh, is facing that. So he knows that all believers will face hardship. Now my third question is, why did Paul think was going to happen to him after prison? Did he think that prison would end in his death? Or did he just think he would be let uh, free? Philippians 1.18 Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. So he actually saw that um, him going to prison would be actually a positive response. And it's my eager expectation and hope that I'd not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honoured in my body. Now the next part's rather interesting, whether by life or by death. He's confident that he should be released, but he also knows if he's not, may God be honoured by his death. May God be honoured by his life. Whether he lives or dies, it's in Christ's hands. And in verse 3, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And you say, well, how can death be gain? Because there are sometimes you realise that your death can be used by God for uh, the ministry to go forth. And uh, one of the interesting things that's happened uh, in the Middle East at the moment is the number of Christians who have been killed and the number of Muslims who are watching Christians being killed and saying, these people have such an amazing faith. They're, they're smiling when they're dying. They're not blaspheming and yelling and screaming. They're praying for people. They're saying things like, Father, forgive them. I want to find out about their faith. And so we're finding thousands of people getting converted by the martyrdom of those who have gone before them. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the gospel uh, going to Korea, it's been a very... Um, rocky road uh, at different times the gospel came to Korea and uh, it was basically squashed and there was an interesting case where uh, this town, a number of people got converted to Christ and uh, the rulers of the land were so upset with them, they, they arrested every single Christian they could find 
gave them all crosses and then made them carry their crosses for kilometre after kilometre after kilometre to go through all the towns in the area to say, this is what we do for people to become Christians. And eventually, after many, many days of these people dragging crosses for the countryside, uh, from the youngest child to the oldest uh, pensioner, so to speak, they were crucified. And what did they do while they were being crucified? They sang Christian songs until eventually there was only one voice left. And then there was silence. I think the authorities thought, fantastic, we've wiped out Christianity. But the people who watched them die, so many of them said, why would be people singing and praising God and dying such an atrocious way? And somehow the church was replanted by the blood of the martyrs. Although there was no known Christian left in the country, many people went looking for the books that had been left behind to discover the Christ they died for. So my fourth question is, what if uh, they killed Paul in prison? How would he see this? Philippians 2.17 Even if I'm poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So he sees that uh, rather than them being bitter and vendettas, they should see that uh, there's a gospel ministry there. Then in Philippians chapter 1, verse uh, 23, I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And so he's very deeply aware of what can happen. He, there's a, a strong sense that uh, prison's not being good to him. And the thought is, if I die tomorrow, then I die a happy person because all the suffering's gone. But there's another part of him saying that I'll continue to suffer because I know that God is using this. Then in Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So he's very, very conscious of what uh, the possibilities could be. My fifth question is this. How did Paul want believers to view him in prison? And Ephesians 3.13 says, So I ask you not to lose heart of what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. And uh, I can imagine for many people, there's a sense of uh, uh, the struggle. But Paul saw that uh, what he was going through, he could be an encouragement for others who were going to follow after him. And uh, what does it mean for us? For some of us, we may go through the most horrific and most horrible of situations. And uh, as we share our testimony sometimes, we're aware that our testimony is enough to say to other people, you can help me in these moments. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been a bit of a burden for me over the last 12 months is that I've had a number of uh, ex-fellowship kids of mine and uh, people who have done lots of things with who have been falsely uh, charged with different things. Um, uh, one of them uh, got massive trouble because they saw that two girls were sitting in his car chatting with each other and they said, obviously you were doing inappropriate things because we saw two girls sitting in your car chatting. And you're thinking that's a, a quantum leap between that and getting him sacked. And uh, so he went through phenomenal hardship through this whole process of uh, uh, basically a false trial. Uh, it's taken many, many, many years, but the Archbishop of Sydney met up with him and deeply apologised, but he went through the whole story. He said, this is the most horrible thing I've ever heard. I cannot believe that these people did this to you. And uh, so I've had a number of people go through dark, dark moments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realise one of the things that can happen is that these people can actually support others who face dark times. And uh, this week alone I've had one person who has gone through a horrifically horrible situation in the church, or a Christian organisation, I should say. And uh, I've sought to try and encourage them at that moment, thinking, the hard times I've gone through, I want to encourage you through what I've gone through to say there is another side. There is, a, there is a future, there is a hope. And Paul has that same sense of saying there is a hope, there is a future. That no matter what hardships happen, 
that God is in the midst of them. And Paul's view of his imprisonment is interesting because you say, if he felt this way about being unjustly imprisoned, how should we feel when we face injustices? How should we feel when we go through hard times? How do we feel when we go through persecution? Are we bitter? Are we bent? Are we twisted? Are we hurt? Or do we use God's grace to say, I'll let God's grace guide me and act as a person of integrity and honour, even if those who are giving us a hard time have no integrity and have no honour. So uh, Paul's words are ones of great encouragement. So let's pray. Father God, as Paul faced hardship and saw your grace as the right way, help us also to have that same grace in how we treat other people. Father God, sometimes it can be immensely hard to forgive those who hurt us, especially those who don't care less. Probably, Father, we know that uh, to not forgive makes our own souls imprisoned. Father, as you've forgiven us, teach us to forgive others. And Father, when we do face hard times, may your Holy Spirit bring a healing within us that the bitterness doesn't take hold of us and destroy us. Amen.